Act. The Isle of Man General Election 2021 coverage on Manx Radio. Good evening. Tonight we're with the candidates for Middle and the constituency of Middle consists of the parishes of Braddon and Moran and now takes in Santon from the old constituency of Maloo and Santon. Now, as the name suggests, the constituency is very much in the middle of the Isle of Man, although it does have a coastline to the southeast between Douglas Central to the north and Arbury Castle Town and Maloo to the south. Now, prior to the dissolution of the House of Keys on the 12th of August, the MHKs were Howard Quayle and Bill Shimmins. Neither is standing, so there will be two brand new MHKs for middle. Our candidates tonight, David Fowler, Kieran Hannafin, Alison Lynch, Stu Peters and Jane Paul Wilson. First of all, to David Fowler, why do you want to become MHK for middle? I, I care passionately about the Isle of Man and the people and the environment. You know, I, I want to um, cut back on the... Um, Climate emergency, you, you know, we, we need more trees, we need, we need um, alternative energies, we need to drive the economy forward, have a much stronger economy, you know, it's really suffered with COVID and we need our taxes spent a lot more efficiently, they're still getting wasted and wasted and we, we you know, I feel we need to look after the people more, you know, there's a lot of vulnerable people on the island and things and, and you know, there's a lot of things need changing. You Kieran, know, Kieran Hannafin. Uh, over the last few years, I've noticed a growing apathy across the island, an apathy and an aggression, which I'm eager to try and fix. We've been, always been told that the Isle of Man doesn't like change. The Isle of Man is going to change with Brexit, COVID, corporation tax. It is going to change, and I'm eager to make sure that it changes for the better and not for the worse. And I'm fairly convinced that I'm a candidate that can do that. Alison Lynch. Thank you, yeah. I've spent uh, 10 years on a local authority, a uh, number of times as chairman, um, which has uh, brought many frustrations that I've had personally with uh, the government. Um, and I would like to make some changes. Um, I care passionately about the constituency. Um, first and foremost are the constituents and then the island as a whole. Thank you. Stu Peters. I've spent 20 years with Manx Radio talking to people about politics on a pretty much daily basis. And over the years, various people have suggested that I ought to stand for politics myself. It never felt the right time previously, but now it does. The other reason is that I'm not getting any younger, so I decided if I don't do it now, I'd probably never do it. So that's my reason for standing. Jane Paul Wilson. Yeah, um, I'm fortunate to be Manx born and brought up here um, and I've lived in Glenvine for 15 years and have a, a strong sense and connection to the community. It was never in my plan to uh, become a member of Tinwald, but I have served in the Legislative Council for the last four years and it's clear to me that if you want to be more directly involved, uh, you really ought to seek the public mandate and, and hence I'm putting myself forward. OK, I'll start with Jane Paul Wilson. Uh, does this government have a green agenda and is it your green agenda or is yours different? I think uh, obviously the climate emergency was declared, which was important. And work is underway, but we really, really need to focus on it now. Um, I think there is, there is a lot to be achieved. We need to plan well for our energy transition. Um, the island will need to renew its, its energy infrastructure in any event. And I believe very strongly that we should focus on trying to do that by capitalising on renewables and storage and putting ourselves in a strong position. David Fowler. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the government's target on tree planting is pretty pathetic it, it should be it should be a lot more and it doesn't necessarily have to be all taxpayers money to pay it we can have corporate sponsorship and we need we need to push forward on all the green energy and things and it it, it doesn't always even necessarily have to cost the taxpayers money because from what i've heard we could lease our seabed out to these wind farm companies and get maybe one or two hundred million pounds a year from it so there's fantastic opportunities there you know Kieran Hannafin a, a mature tree absorbs 21 kilos of oxygen a year that's once it's matured the Isle of Man produces 0.86 megatons a year planting 70,000 non-native trees that a lot of them are going to die it isn't enough we need re-establishment of the interconnector to sign contracts for difference and a lot of other things such as making waste disposal nationwide instead of 
local government. Uh, as you've been on the doorstep, do you find this subject comes up? A lot, yeah. Um, mixed reviews with people. Um, a lot of people are concerned at how much money is being spent. Alison Lynch. Yeah, um, I mean, I've done quite a lot of homework on this um, over the last few months. And research from the Met Office states that burning fossil fuels, coal, oil and gas produces energy, but it also releases greenhouse gases, such as carbon dioxide. These gases build up, form a blanket around the planet that traps the heat from the sun and causes the Earth to heat up. Other facts are that the five warmest years have all occurred since 2006. One quarter of human-made greenhouse gas emissions come from burning fossil fuels. In 50 years' time, in our children's lifetime, the Met Office projects that winters will be 4.5 degrees warmer and up to 30% wetter. Summers will be between up to 6% warmer and 60% drier. And what can the Alabama government do about that? We could be leading by example now. Um, there's a lot that we can do for, for climate change, but we, we must get on board with it. It's been spoken about for so long, uh, but we must get on board. We need to speak to the experts and get on board with Steve it. Steve Peters. Um, I've been called a climate change denier, and I'm not, um, but I do question some of the accepted science on it. I'm not sure that CO2 is the bogeyman that everybody makes it out to be. But if I was to agree with all that, if I was to concede all those points, my view on this is that the Isle of Man shouldn't be an early adopter. We shouldn't be leading the way. We ought to wait for other people to establish the technology to deal with it and then follow that. Um, and I certainly don't think that we ought to be spending tens of millions of pounds on more reports and more committees. Do you think we should have offshore or onshore wind? Um, I think we ought to be exploiting this gas field off Mackled Head. OK. Uh, now, uh, David Fowler, should we be accepting Afghan refugees on the Isle of Man? Um, I'd say definitely not. We don't have the infrastructure for them. You know, there's interpreters and things we need and mental health and all those sort of things. Do you agree with... I mean, the UN recommends 0.7% of GDP for international aid. Do you agree with that? I, I don't particularly, we should give some money, but I think more of it should be diverted to, to the Isle of Man. You know, charity begins at home, I think. Jane Paul Wilson. Yeah, um, I do think we should uh, take our part on the global stage, and I do think we should uh, build to our 0.7 of GDP. Um, and as far as the refugees are concerned, um, these are people who have supported the British Armed Forces and have been left in a perilous situation. And actually, we're talking frequently about skilled people. Um, and the island, uh, if we look at figures at the end of July, we had about 450 unemployed and 650-odd vacancies. So the island does need skilled people, and I think it's the right thing. Stu Peters. Uh, I don't think we should take Afghan refugees, no, unless these are people who've got specific skills that we can use, unless they speak English, unless they're prepared to assimilate in the Manx uh, society. I think it would be a dangerous thing to do. Alison Lynch. Yes, I think we, um, we should be receiving um, these displaced people. Um, we could be in a situation where we can take people who have worked in the British military hospitals, for example, would we turn away um, a heart surgeon? Would we turn away somebody with skills that can be used on the Isle of Man? Um, as at today's figures, it would mean us um, accepting in the region of 57 uh, displaced people. And you would say that's acceptable? Yes. Why should the Isle of Man be any different? We must play our part. Kieran Hannafin. Uh, to paraphrase Tony Benn, he said you should pay attention to how a government looks after their immigrants, uh, after how they look after their refugees, because that's how they'd look after you if they could. Um, on the Isle of Man, we are a crown dependent. For a Timwell day, we had an RAF fly over a princess whilst the military marched guns in front of one of our schools. We do support the military, and because of that, we should support our share of refugees. And that's morals aside. Morals aside, this is refugee help. If a house is burning down, you don't ask for the skills that the people have before you let them out of the burning building. We absolutely should. Uh, Stu Peters, how do we refloat? How does the Manx economy recover after COVID? 
I think it will recover fairly naturally after COVID. I think the government's done a fairly good job of dealing with it as best it could. I think it's done a reasonably good job in trying to provide aid where it was required. Remember that some industries have probably done quite well out of COVID. Uh, <clears throat> But the tourism sector, particularly hospitality, has been devastated by it. So that's where we need to, uh, to, to be concentrating in the short term. Do you see uh, tourism, the infrastructure, the visiting trade as a, as a priority? Do you think we need to maintain that infrastructure? The, the trouble with the tourist trade is that it's always been important to the Isle of Man and people look at it through rose-tinted spectacles, I think. Uh, the government say that it only contributes a, a small percentage to uh, the revenue of the state, but I think it's got a much wider implication. People who do homestays, people who run guest houses, people who run hospitality businesses, all rely very heavily on the tourist uh, sector, although the money from all that doesn't necessarily go into Treasury. Alison Lynch. Yeah, the economy is um, obviously something that is a top priority for every candidate across the island. We must rebuild the economy, we must invest in local businesses, support local businesses, try and attract businesses to relocate to the Isle of Man. What sort of businesses? Financial businesses, hospitality businesses, um, and you know, I know some people will say, well, local hospitality businesses are struggling, but um, there's a lot of businesses doing very, very well. And we also need to take political risk as well. What do you mean, political risk? Uh, in attracting businesses over to the island. Okay, could you be a bit more specific? Uh, finance businesses, um, you know, e-commerce businesses, um, you know, just instead of just resting on, on our laurels and absolutely going by the rule book, why not just, you know, try and not break the rules, but or bend the rules, but just make be, our own rules. Well, not make our own rules. We have to, you know, we have to. Well, we, we can. I mean, well, of course we can. That's why, you know, we can, but uh, not to the detriment of people on the island. Kieran Hannafin. Uh, the first thing to do would be to stop paying one sixth of our works, force below living wage. We can't have an economy if there's no money going around in it, if no one can start businesses, if no one can pay their rent, if no one can pay their staff. All these things, the first step is to put money in people's pockets with most things. Do you think there should be a statutory minimum enforced? It should be living wage or above. And we shouldn't be able to call ourselves a first world affluent country where one sixth of our population are paid 24.1% less than they need to participate in society they're giving their hours up to. Okay, and how do you think the Isle of Man can refloat the economy and charge forward now? That's how. Um, a lot of people say, well, where does the money come from? If you were able to set up your own business and pay your staff at living wage, then you can pr provide a service that you can sell externally, nationwide or worldwide. So if you can't pay the living wage, you shouldn't be in business? No. Um, as for the living wage, it is written massively in my manifesto. It'll take me a while to talk about it fully extend, but it's Martin's big rebuild on the benefit system. David Fowler. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we want inward investment, you know, we want to get company talking with companies, get them setting up hubs here, you know, I mean, back in 2010, centre parks tried to come here, that, that would help tourism, they were turned away, I don't know why, but we could get them back talking, uh, we want inward, we, we want high net worth individuals to come here and invest in our economy. Do you see the Isle of Man as a premium holiday resort for people outside the Isle of Man, like centre parks? I think so, yeah. And I mean, I think we could do a lot more to get tourists here. I mean, I, we, we bought Steam Packet, but the fares are still sky high. If we had a lower price structure on, on the ferry fares, we could get heaps of tourists here. You so know. The, you think the Isle of Man government should enter the market, should vary the market, manipulate the market to bring holidaymakers here cheaply? Yeah, I'm, I mean, at the moment, the, 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 the boats, from what I've heard are only filling an average of 30% of capacity. So if you, if you had cheap affairs, you might have 60 or 70% of the seats filled and you'd get at least as much money back, if not a bit more on top, you Jane, know. Jane Paul Wilson. Um, I think our economy is, deserves to have existing strengths uh, supported, so our finance sector and so on. But I think it is important that we position ourselves well for the future. And I think the opportunities probably lie in tech, 
fintech and so on, um, research and development work, but also the green future. I think you know the island has great opportunity as we start to look at um, the, the energy transition at our housing stock and at other areas to actually see some growth, some new sectors coming along. Okay, which brings me on to education. <clears throat> Putting aside the students who go across away for university, do you think we're educating our non-university students successfully and well enough to enter those new trades? I, I think we need to look much more closely at more apprenticeships and vocational training. I, it's absolutely clear that the island is crying out for skills. There are plenty of young people who have talent, which is not necessarily academic talent, who should be enabled to thrive and flourish. Why would that be then, that, that, that we have school leavers coming out who don't have appropriate skills for the marketplace on the Isle of Man? Well, I think if you're talking about apprenticeships and vocational training, the system that currently operates, which is in line with our neighbours, is that we encourage people to stay in education uh, to GCSE level and we don't focus so much on the vocational. Um, but I do think even at that stage, we do need to do more in terms of apprenticeship offerings. Stu Peters? Yeah, I think that the, the modern way is that, for, that most uh, young people go away to university. And I think that there are concerns about the fact that once they go away, they're not going to come back. I don't think that they will come back until they're in the 30s and they've got children. Because let's face it, you know, somebody who's been brought up on the Isle of Man suddenly wants to spread the wings, get away from the parents, go across to university, be in a city that's a 24-7 sort of a society. And it's a very exciting place to be. And they're going to get a better worldview from it. So we shouldn't worry too much about getting kids back. You think they will come back of their own accord? Yes. Again, I think that most of these things are, are fairly natural and I think that a lot of young people will come back because especially if their family is here, they'll, they'll go across to the UK or wherever <coughs> Excuse me, and spread the wings, do all that kind of stuff. But I think that then they'll realise as they get children themselves that the Isle of Man is a great place to be and they'd rather be near the family. Alison Lynch, uh, the education question and returning students. OK. Um... I, I have a big issue with this because uh, at the moment I have a constituent who is at University College Isle of Man and doing a teacher training and at the end of it she has to go to the UK to do a year's work experience. Why? That, I, I would love somebody to answer that question for me. Why are we sending our university graduates to the UK for teacher training? This is to why, validate a, a teaching why, certificate. But why can't yeah. it be done here? You know, we, we, we work alongside Chester University, so why can that be done here? What's so different to our schools uh, and to those in the UK? Because the danger is, um, and well, the, the student doesn't want to go to the UK, um, it's going to cost her money, it's going to cost her family money, she doesn't want to leave her family, she has to go, and the, the danger is that she may not actually come back. Uh, do you think we lose too many university students who go to Leeds, to Liverpool, to Manchester, yes. never come back. Yes, we do. And how do, um, we, how do we combat that? Well, s some people don't come back because what they have graduated in at, at university, they then can't find that particular employment on the Isle of Man. So, you know, we need to e e expand the, the skills and the businesses on the Isle of Man. Kieran Hannafin. Oh, yeah, there's more to life than a vocation. Sorry. There's more to life than vocation. It's the same thing of why we can't keep teachers here as well as students. It's that overall the habitat itself isn't that luring. If it was, we wouldn't have to keep putting a shiny lure to trick people to come over here. If you had the, a situation where rest, restaurants might be open on a Monday, more people might be here to do stuff. The problem is, is that the opportunity for the average man isn't really available here. And once the average man has the availability, the entire habitat improves, which helps everyone on step upwards. So you think the depth of the entertainment offering isn't deep enough for people on the island? It's not just entertainment. There is that. You know, there is the entertainment issue. I am an entertainer on the island, and I know that side of things. But there is vocation as well. You know, by and large, our students are funneled into university to come back here and get an office job. Those office jobs are one of two things, which is either securing rich people's money, which a lot of people don't want to do, or forcing people into gambling. Forcing, encouraging people into gambling, which also isn't really the most ethically okay job. Uh, do you think the, the e-gaming industry in the Isle of Man is unethical? 
Uh, yeah, especially when we talk about um, allowing patients cannabis, for instance, and we discuss the ethics around that. Um, no one has ever smoked a joint and gambled their house away after a bottle of wine. Um, yeah, because we're already making money from that industry, we're quite happy to encourage it. So yeah, it is pr gambling is unethical. Okay, we'll come back to cannabis shortly. David Fowler, back to uh, non-university students' education and university students coming back to the Isle of Man. Yeah, I mean, we definitely want more apprenticeships and training schemes here. And, and I think we should even be looking at um, sort of paying back <clears throat> part or all of the, the student grants in return for them coming back to, f to fill the jobs we need filled here. So you know? there should be a return on investment for, for those student uh, fees that are paid? Yes, not immediately, though. You, you know, over a, over a number of years. Yeah. Alison Lynch to Cannabis. Do you support the legalisation of medicinal and or recreational cannabis? I definitely support medicinal cannabis. Uh, recreational, it would need to be extremely well controlled. Um, there's pluses and minuses. Um, if it was um, legalised, you would then take away the, the dealer, um, who is probably not supplying pure cannabis. So, you know, you, people are getting it illegally now. Um, but it would have to be extremely well controlled. Stu Peters. Medicinal cannabis, yes, <clears throat> without question. Uh, recreational cannabis, I'm a little bit on the fence, but leaning towards decriminalising it. I think we should certainly decriminalise it, uh, but to make it legal, I, I can't see many reasons not to. But talking to people on the doorstep, people have got very fixed views on this. And they are? Sorry? What are they? Uh, uh, one chap that I spoke to is absolutely against it being decriminalised for recreational use because he reckons that the island is going to be full of people who are, who are drugged up driving around. I made the point that you can still test for it like you can for alcohol, but, but he was absolutely you know, convinced that it would be a bad thing. Uh, other people have talked about the potential damage to young people's brains uh, from, uh, uh, from cannabis. Uh, so, you know, we've got to have assurances or reassurances about that. And I believe that if it was decriminalised, if it was made legal, and if government uh, effectively supplied it, they could make sure that there were none of the harmful ingredients in that is making people going crazy. Jane Paul Wilson. Yes, uh, supportive of uh, medicinal cannabis. I think the approach to recreational cannabis needs to be well thought through because of some of the things that the others have already touched on. I think it's important that um, we don't, what we're doing at the moment doesn't work. Uh, it, it's not right, I don't think, that we are seeing people criminalise, particularly young people, for very small amounts. However, I think just decriminalising without looking at the whole picture in terms of the regulation and the content and so on, I think leaves open other problems. Bearing so in mind there are jurisdictions around the world where it is legal, it has been decriminalised, uh, and the Isle of Man can be fleet of foot with legislation, is there or not any sort of opportunity for the Isle of Man? I think the Isle of Man also has to bear in mind that it would have to work closely with the Ministry of Justice in the UK because uh, this would be an area where there would need to be some close working. Uh, David Fowler. Uh, yeah, I'm highly supportive of the medicinal cannabis. You know, that's, that's excellent. We want that. Um, I don't think realistically cannabis will get, recreational cannabis will get uh, legalised overnight, but I would be highly supportive of um, decriminalisation for, for puny amounts of the drug because it takes up court time. Such as how much? I, I don't know. I mean, you've, you know, pe teeny, teeny amounts. But I, I don't know. I mean, obviously it'd have to be reviewed. I'm not an expert on it. It'd have to be a panel of people and decide what they decide is a small amount and what is. And Kieran Hannafin. Uh, for medicinal, 99.2% in favour on a public consultation that was done 30 months ago, the most completed consultation that I'm aware of, has been ignored for 30 months, which has made cannabis twice the price for a patient to receive during a health pandemic. If elected, it'll be the first motion I put through to give prescription, private at least, to patients. As for recreational, I personally am very pro. It's not about my opinion, it would have to go to public mandate first, but I would be very supportive and 
more than willing to work with Department of Health and Social Care and Enterprise to make sure that that comes through correctly. And do you think there's a bridge to be crossed when it comes to recreational cannabis? Uh, you only have to walk down Strand Street any Friday or Saturday night mm. and smell the amount that's being smoked. Uh, so it is on the Isle of Man, whether or not people want to accept it or not. Uh, do you think it's a, uh, uh, we're trying to push water uphill by, by trying to keep cannabis at bay? Absolutely. All, all we're doing is making a bigger risk versus reward for the dealers in Liverpool who will never be tried. Mm. So the 11-year-old who gets caught with £30,000 here, that's no risk to the person in Liverpool, but if he doesn't get caught, he's just got twice the payday. We are encouraging knife crime on the Isle of Man. We are encouraging black markets on the Isle of Man. So, yeah. Uh, Jane Paul Wilson, let's come to affordable housing nowadays. Um, and are you picking this up on the doorstep about the, the cost of housing and the barrier to entry for young people particularly and also for older people downsizing? Mm, both, absolutely, yes. Uh, I would say this is a, a theme across the constituency. Uh, people are concerned about different aspe <coughs> aspects of housing and I do think the next administration needs to focus on this quickly and develop a coherent policy. I think we need to look at our help to buy schemes because I don't think they're working anymore in it, it, to, to help people but I also think it's about availability and I'm really really keen now to see the Manx Development Corporation bear fruit in driving some high quality development on our brownfield sites. Stu Peters. Yeah I think that uh, government if it's possible ought to be building first-time buyers homes I don't think it be, should be going to developers to make a, a, a big profit out of it I think that the percentage of first-time buyer homes needs to increase on, on uh, developments and it does come up a lot on the doorstep. I'm a lifelong capitalist and I've always thought that if somebody works hard, puts a few quid to one side and wants to invest it later in life, they should be able to put it into anything that's legal. I do think now we've got a national crisis as far as affordable housing is concerned. Crisis? Yes. And I think it puts that to one side. And, and therefore, uh, I think that, uh, that first-time buyer homes should be available to owner-occupiers only, not to people to buy as an investment to rent out, because we hear about a lot of these houses that are bought by investors, many off-island, uh, and that is skewing the market. So first-time buyer houses should be built by government and only sold to people that are going to live in them. Uh, do you think that the Isle of Man government could build houses on time and on budget? <laughs> Good question. Um, I think that, yes, yes. Okay. A, 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 and just a final point on that, all of them should be passive or partly passive. There shouldn't be a single house or building on the Isle of Man that isn't you know, using those sort of passive technologies. Alison Lynch. Affordable housing and first-time buyer housing has been very much in the forefront um, when knocking on doors. Um, and I think the government need to um, concentrate on brownfield site building. We have a couple of sites just that spring to mind straight away, which is the former prison site and Park Road School. They're cleared, they're ready, they're ready to be built on. You know, the government could be building on those. They could be building eco houses. Um, there's a private house that's been built on Victoria Road to very low cost, but very carbon neutral. The Isle of Man government could be doing exactly the same. But also, our housing market needs to be looked at immediately. We have estate agents. Um, and people are being gazumped out of houses today. Uh, how many first-time buyers were there on the Crosby estate? Do you know? Uh, yes, there are eight. OK. How many could there have been, in your opinion? Mm, probably, for the number that have been built, eight. But there are also developments within the constituency and across the island um, that the developer has managed to um, play the planning system and um, not build first-time buyer properties. Kieran Hannafin. Um, affordable, so I keep doing that, sorry. Affordable housing is an issue because you can't afford a house on £8.25 an hour and we always talk about affordable housing assuming that everyone wants to own a house. A big part of the problem that people don't seem to be looking at is rentals. If you're paying £900 a month rent on a house that would be on a mortgage of 1600 that doesn't give you a credit score to be able to borrow against it for a mortgage. Um, we have no DHSS agreements still on flats now. Even the UK is ahead of us on that. We, ha we can't get affordable housing if all we're doing is building cheap houses for people who already own properties. David Fowler. 
Yeah, I mean, we want more um, help to buy schemes and things, and we need to build more affordable houses. And um, do you mean private developers need to need to build them as part of a uh, as part of a development? Because at yeah, the moment, I'm, I'm, there has to be a, affordable housing has to be a portion of any development. Yeah, I mean, I think instead of using these big construction companies, which are probably creaming a huge profit even on the low cost houses, the government should be contracting sort of medium sized building companies to build them at cost so there's not a big markup on the price so they'd be kind of truly affordable, you know. How do you stop private people making a very good living out of lots, owning lots of houses? Well re really, the, certainly the, the um, affordable ones at the very least should be um, for residents only, not, not inward investors, you know. Okay, half past seven it is. We're live tonight at Douglas Rugby Club at uh, Port uh, By the way, the A and the S has fallen off. It says Douglas Rugby Club outside. So let's go to the audience now. And uh, we've got some questions from the audience. Who's first for us with a question from the audience? And your name, sir, and your question. Uh, Roy Crowland. Um, just about recycling. Um, we're massive in our house about recycling. Um, cans, batteries, papers, plastics. But what I find is when you go around the sites to drop off these recycling, you know, when we do our own, the bins are overflowing. So I believe recycling should start at home, but what would you do to encourage it? Kieran Hannafin. I, I think waste should be nationwide, so you'll tax your paper, not your rates, if, because it's, it's such a big part of the climate issue. When we call a crisis, we need to start acting like it's a nationwide crisis. What I'd like to see is you do it at the source, bring it to wherever else. Say you're a millionaire and I'm not, both of us get a speeding ticket. 60 pounds is going to cripple me, it's not going to cripple you. So it's legal for a price for you. An hour versus an hour. Community service, taking caps off bottles, separation of waste. That then gets put into a plant which is aerated, turned into insulation boards, given to every man's house for free. 250 pounds saved in carbon emissions and value per year. That's my idea for it. David Fowler. Yeah, I mean, I'm very keen on recycling, for promoting it and things. And, I mean, I've, I've seen that as well, these, these um, sort of skip things where you put all the clothes and the bottles in and things. They're not emptied enough. I mean, something needs to be done about that. I mean, they empty your bins every week, which is going to the incinerator, and they, they, they deprioritise recycling. You know, they should have the same attitude with the recycling empty them regularly so they're not sort of overflowing. Uh, Mr Fowley, do you think it's the, the user's obligation to take the recycling somewhere else, thereby increasing the carbon footprint? Uh, don't you think it should be central government or the local authority doing the recycling? They're doing Douglas. They, they come and empty yeah. people's recycling bins. I mean, it's a bit of both, really. I mean, a lot of people drive around. So, I mean, I, I don't normally make a special journey if I'm taking recycling. I make sure I, I do it on a day when I'm going past where they are, you know. I, I think that's probably what a lot of people do, or that's what I would hope they okay, would Okay, this doing. comes into the green agenda. Jane Paul Wilson, recycling? Yes, uh, I, I think, I mean, like you, we put a big emphasis on it, and we do take our recycling on a regular basis to the civic community site. But the feedback, actually, when you talk to people, particularly around the Citizens Forum on Climate Change, is a recognition that people would find it much more convenient if it was doorstep collected. I think um, Kieran's comments as well about how can we build more of a circular economy on the Isle of Man, so how do we sustain ourselves and what is viable for us to reuse and recycle is really valid, and I think the next administration should be looking hard at that and working closely with local authorities. Stu Peters? I think that a lot of these things, what we ought to be looking at is making it easy for people to do. So where I live, we don't have curbside collection, so everything goes in the one bin. And I think that if we all just threw all our refuse in one bin and it was then recycled later, you know, if we employed people or we got machines in to actually sort the waste, then that would be a, a better solution to this. Alison Lynch. I'm very pro-recycling, um, in agreement with what some of my colleagues have said. Um, the Western Civic Community site recycle, at the moment, 73% of what goes over through the gate, um, which equates to around about £140,000 a year. Um, I, I disagree with when you say that everybody in Douglas recycles. They don't, because blocks of flats don't have recycle bins. There are bring banks around the island, uh, which are owned by the uh, Department of in Infrastructure, 
but they will not supply a bin for plastics. They have to go to the civic community sites. Um, I take mine to my place of work because we get them collected from there. Um, so, you know, the government needs to be doing a lot more also. Uh, do you find on the doorstep, do you think most people understand recycling, they get recycling and they're keen to recycle? Yes, I do. Um, and, you know, even around where I live, people do recycle. You know, you, you'll have days when you'll, you see your neighbours filling their car full of recycling to, to go to the civic community sites, but there's a lot more we could be doing. OK, your name, sir, and your question. Uh, Ian Wright. Uh, it's almost certainly going to be one of the re-elected MHKs who becomes the next chief minister. Assuming they're successful next week, who would you like to see stand and who would you support? Stu Peters. Uh, it's a case of waiting to see who's, who's in. I mean, we just don't know. Al Alf Cannon would be a, a, a good chief minister, I think. Alex Allinson, maybe. I don't know. Uh, we'd have to see who, who is elected and we'd have to hear pitches from them and see whether or not our ideals marry with theirs. Why would Alf Cannon be a good chief minister? Because he's articulate, he's smart, and I think that those are qualities that we need in a chief minister. Alison Lynch? Impossible to answer. I'd love to answer it. I was asked this question last week and, you know, as much as I would like to give you a name, ask me on the 24th whether I'm successful or not and I will, I will give you my opinion. Kieran Hannafin. I think it's important for candidates to say who their chief minister is because it's the best chance that anyone has of electing their chief minister directly because they might not like me but they might vote for me based on who the chief minister is and for me, as it stands, it's Chris Thomas. David Fowler. Um, I would say absolutely Juan Watterson. He's, he's, um, he's got a lot of experience. He's been in 15 years. And I, I listen to the Tinwald broadcast every week, and I've heard some of the things he says, and he's, he's, he's got a lot of ideas. You know, he's a very bright individual, so I'd, I'd definitely back Juan. Jane Paul Wilson. Yeah, for me, it has to be a person with really, really good leadership qualities because I think it's so important to bring people with you. I would want to see, if I was elected as an MHK, I'd absolutely want to see what the focus was going to be in the priorities. Like Stu, the names that are out there in terms of Alf Cannon and Alex Allenson, I think both of them would be capable, but what I would really, really be interested in is what are they going to prioritise and focus on because I think that absolutely matters for this next administration that there is clear strategic prioritization and we don't end up with a program for government that's all things to all people and too cumbersome and, and risks not achieving some key strategic aims. Uh, live on Manx Radio tonight we're with the uh, candidates standing for Middle, the constituency of Middle, with David Fowler, Kieran Hannafin, Alison Lynch, Stu Peters and Jane Paul Wilson. Uh, your name and your question please. Les Foster. Um, the prior administration, um, I think I can make a very long list of failures and arrogance. Yet we can't remove politicians during their term. We have no power to do that. And we can't remove failing departmental CEOs. What are your views on that? Kieran Hannafin. You can remove an MHK. You can get the captain of the parish to do a requisition meeting. You can vote for them to stand down, just as a side note. Um, as for the CEOs, shy of giving huge redundancy pays, you have to wait for their contracts to run out. We talk about cutting size of government all the time. Unless you're wanting to pay a huge bill that's going to be like a pension bill, those redundancy pay packages across hundreds of people at a time is going to be a lot. Um, there definitely should be performance reviews, though. Alison Lynch. Yeah, I don't, I don't see why um, an MHK, um, an MLC, anybody cannot be dismissed from their job if, if they're doing a bad job. What's so different about the public sector than the private sector? You know, if, if something was to go horrendously wrong in the private sector, you would be shown the door. Why should it be so different? That is probably something that <coughs> needs to be reviewed and looked at. Thank you for the question. Uh, what do you think about uh, senior, I mean, heads of uh, departments, heads of, head of ministries, the senior civil servants, uh, get paid six figures and more, uh, high six figures. Um, how do you feel about uh, holding people like that to account? I've had um, some civil servants saying to me on the doorstep um, that they are um, public sector workers, they're very comfortable in their job. 
Um, really, they, you know, they're there for the ride. They've been there, you know, 30 plus years or more. Um, and they're untouchable. Why? Stu Why? Peters? I think it's a good question. I mean, at least a politician's only there for five years, and you can get rid of them after five years. I don't know whether or not Kieran's right that you can get rid of them sooner. They're okay. only there for five years. The civil service is there for life, usually, and I see that as the biggest problem. Uh, reading the Beeman's report into the DOI recently, it seems that their performance is measured on effort rather than on results. So if everybody says, yes, we're all very busy, then that's good enough, but it's not good enough. Mm -hmm. So what we need is to give targets, key performance indicators, to people from the chief executive down. And if they don't achieve those targets, then it's time for a, a bit of a tough word. Jane Paul Wilson. Yeah, I mean, we have in this last five years seen a couple of chief executives leave uh, in the Department of Education and uh, in the Department of Health, actually. But what's interesting is what leads up to those uh, departures. And I think I, I agree that one of the things that's absent for me is absolute clarity about what the business plan is what the targets are, and then how we're going to account and measure progress. Because it should be much, much easier to assess how people are doing, particularly our leaders, against what is being projected. Now, of course, we know in the real world not everything goes according to plan, and COVID is a very good example of how even the best laid plans can be thrown off course. But in the normal course, I think it is about that transparency and that clarity that then makes it blindingly obvious, actually, that people are falling short and it's either time for them to go or be removed. Uh, Richard Fowler, uh, David Fowler. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's why I'm standing. I'm, I'm disgusted with our government. You know, five years ago, they were all saying we want a smaller, smarter government. And what have we got? 500 more civil servants, a billion more in pension liabilities. And, and they're just going the wrong way, you know. OK. assertion that we can requisition the captain of the parish um, if a particular minister is in another constituency then I can't do much about that yeah mm, so agreed. we're splitting here between we've got a local locally elected politician that is failing on national issues mm. the rest of the public are powerless okay oh, uh, any more questions any more? For, otherwise, I've got half a dozen. Here. Oh, sorry. Yes, sir. You're, oh, you're back on. <laughs> Roy again. Hmm. I touched, you touched before on tourism. Um, I'm growing up in the 70s. My father was a coach driver. Tourism was there massively. Foot passengers coming in, ships, boats, full, full to capacity. People coming in. What could we do to attract that back? So a lot of the tourists that are coming now are coming on coaches, coming straight into the island. Stay for a week and go back on the same coach. Uh, okay, uh, well, to... like someone picked up on, you know, a centre parks, maybe a Ruby Hall, like. Okay, and also I'm going to throw into there as well, if I may. I'm going to ask about the future of the TT, Kieran Hannafin. Anything we can do to put rockets under our tourist offering? And do you think think the TT is going to last? I think healthcare tourism is how we bring tourism forward, which does a heck of a lot for the Isle of Man. Healthcare. He healthcare tourism. Yeah. So effectively, if you pay ten thousand pound, is the price for a hip replacement. If we brought four private patients over from the UK and charged them 12.50, every four you bring, you get one free hip replacement to the Isle of Man. You use all the funds that you make for that, put it back into the public healthcare system, which means we get a world-class healthcare system, you get a boost of our economy, and you get the tourism Do you back. think the TT is going to last? Um, I'm unsure, to be honest. Um, the Isle of Wight obviously cancelled theirs or decided they didn't want it. And someone brought up the point to say, well, if we were asked today and hadn't had the TT for the last 100 years, would you want it? And I don't think people would. Jane Paul Wilson. Yeah, I think um, I grew up in the 70s here as well, so I well remember the last days, I suppose, of the bucket and spade holidays that people would come on here. I, I think we have to rethink our, our positioning. You know, that... that time has gone. Um, I do think we've got a huge amount though going for us and I look at other jurisdictions where perhaps you know the weather isn't the best all year round. If you look at Iceland, you look at Scotland, they have amazing capacity to attract people on holiday um, and, and people who have disposable income who will then spend and I think the really important thing is our heritage 
is an important part of our culture in the island, costs a lot of money, the more we can expand our vision for tourism and <coughs> attract people with disposable income, the more we, we drive some revenue coming in to what, help support What do you think is that. our totemic offering? What do you think is the Isle of Man's USP to somebody who's never been here before? It's interesting about the TT, isn't it? Because if you ask people what, what they know the island for, they will mention things like the TT and maybe Manx Cats. I wonder whether our new offering, and I'm not sure we're there yet, is really positioned around the biosphere. Um, and, you know, attached to that is our environment, culture, food, etc., etc. Stu Peters? I think that we're never going to get the days that you talk about. It's just never going to happen. You know, Frank Whittle spoiled that when he invented the jet engine. Um, so what we've got to do is to play to our strengths. We, we are already niche marketing the Isle of Man holidays, and we've got to continue to do that. We've got to do it better, I think. Uh, I don't remember seeing anything particularly different from the Department of Tourism, or whatever it's called now, uh, over the last 10 or 15 years. So I think we need to get smarter about it. In terms of, you know, what's the Isle of Man to be famous for, we've got great history here. Uh, not everybody wants to come on a walking holiday or a cycling holiday, but we've got great history here as well. So maybe that's the kind of thing that would attract people. Alison Lynch. Uh, in agreement with my, my, my colleagues, actually, we unfortunately will never get back to um, the 1970s and, and before that. Um, as far as people coming over on English registration plate coaches, um, it must be a cost why is it more cost effective? Um, is it the same for a group of people going on holiday from the Isle of Man? Do they take an Isle of Man coach from Douglas with them? Um, it would be nice if people came over and it was coach holidays from the moment you arrived at the sea terminal, for example. Um, TT, I live inside the TT course, have done for all of my life. Um, would I like to see it cancelled? Probably not, no. no. Do you think it's going but to... But I, th I think it needs to change. Sure. Um, you know, we talk about carbon net zero, and yet we're going to allow bikes full of fuel to, you know, give out all these revolting smells. David Fowler. Yeah, I mean, as I said before, I, I think now we own the ferry company, we should be have more involvement in the pricing because the, the the price to get a car over here is, is a small fortune. You said that twice. Do you think then that uh, somebody should come up with a scheme, a matrix, whereby anybody coming on holiday can come here for a fiver or something silly like that? I don't think that at all, no, but I, I would be in favour of outside of the TT period having some kind of cap on it so you're paying if you bring your car over it's a hundred pounds each way and you would get heaps of people coming here okay uh, next question your name sir and the question uh, paul crane and um, in the isle of man in the last 10 years the number of births have fallen by 35 percent at the other end of the age scales the number of people here aged over 65 puts us in the top six countries on the planet is very high what would the candidates do about that? Perhaps which, first, which of those figures concerns them the most? And what would they do about Stu it? Stu Peters. Yeah, the low birth rate is a real problem. I honestly don't know what the answer is to that. Uh, I really don't know. Obviously, we've not got enough young people here, and we need more young people. This, this comes on to things like immigration and whether or not we should have more people moving to the Isle of Man, whether or not 100,000 people, which is a figure that's been bandied about, is a sensible one. I would suggest it is. We need more economically active people who can make more babies uh, and look after the oldies like me. Alison Lynch. Um, I agree with what you're saying, Paul. We do have an ageing demographic. I'm lucky enough that both my parents are still alive in their 80s. Um, the lack of young people on the island is a concern. And is that due to them not coming back um, post-graduation from university? The cost of houses, the cost of rent renting... Uh, we need to encourage, um, th this can all fall into attracting businesses to the Isle of Man. Businesses will penultimately employ a younger generation. Um, and it's important because the young people are the future of our island. David Fowler. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a big problem, really. I mean, a, a lot of that comes down to... Um, not having enough affordable housing and the cost of living and things, but the Isle of Man isn't unique. I know a lot of people say, 
oh, it costs a fortune to live on the Isle of Man, but housing is very, very expensive across, you know, it's, it's a universal problem, really. And, yeah. and do you think we have a generational time bomb coming then? Not enough young people and people getting older and requiring um, medical treatment and uh, obviously drawing benefits and pensions? I think so, yes. You know, we, we need to attract more young people to come here, really. Kieran, Kieran Hannafin. If we want to increase the birth rate, we either need to lessen our education quality or improve our quality of life because people are smart enough to know that they can't bring children up in a bad environment. If you lessen any habitat, the animals stop breeding. That's across the globe on every ecosystem in the world. Okay, where do you stand on uh, things? Uh, many people who have children complain about the cost of preschool care and mm. education. Yeah, I think this is something should be brought in where there's a, um, I don't want to use the word nationalised, but that's what I mean, like a publicly funded childcare option, whether or not that's incentivising businesses to have creches, or if it's incentivising the government to pay off a chunk of that. Jane Paul Wilson. I, I think uh, it's a really good question. I think we have to recognise that um, the falling birth rate probably can be attributed to a number of things. Um, yes, it might be about the number of young people that we attract to live here, but also you have to ask the question, why people might choose not to have children or have children later. And I think you have to have, I think we need as an island to look at now increasing our, um, our, our, our support for young families. And I think looking at our maternity and paternity legislation is very important. I think childcare is absolutely important as part of this good quality early years care with funding and extension of preschool credit. I think all of these things will make a massive difference. Okay, it has to be said, of course, that um, uh, falling birth rate isn't uh, just exclusive to the Isle of Man. It's happening all over Western Europe. So your name and the question? Uh, Dolan Mercer. Lots of the biggest problems in the previous administration and probably in the next administration relate uh, and I say biggest both financially and in terms of public perception, relate to capital projects. What are you going to do to get to the bottom of what's happened in lots of the most high-profile projects over the last few years? And how do you change future procurement to stop these things happening again? Okay, quickly, each in 30 seconds, David Fowler. Um, well, I, I, I'd say they, they need to have like penalty clauses in these contracts. It seems the, the developers seem to that are doing these contracts seem to get away with anything and, and the government do as well. The budgets just keep going up and up and it's, you know, it should be a fixed price and it shouldn't go over, but it, it never does, does it? Kieran Hannafin. I'm um, with the penalty side of things, but as well as that, we need people who can negotiate these contracts well in the first place, like the Liverpool uh, ferry. The front page of the news was that we were outclassed in negotiations. We should have people on our behalf who can actually deal. Uh, Alison Lynch? People need to be held accountable for, uh, for what they've done. Um, and there are, there are set prices and there are set time deadlines built and there are penalty notices um, built into the contracts, the promenade, for example. But I would like to know, you know, COVID, to, COVID aside, why have these penalty notices not been adhered to? Okay, Jane Paul Wilson. Yeah, I think we, I'm in favour of a central capital uh, project unit that can access the appropriate expertise. And it's, it's of note to me that when the government bought the steam packet, they did bring in the expertise of part partners to do all the due diligence and work. And actually, Tinwald members could have some confidence and faith in the reporting there. And I think we need to see that replicated, where we don't have the skill set on island and we can't easily access it. Make sure we get the right expertise, because ultimately that will help us deliver better. Stu Peters. I think that the problem is, is almost entirely government rather than contractors, so I don't necessarily think that penalty clauses are the answer. What we've got to do is to have a smarter government, smarter departments, smarter people there. For too many years we've been throwing money at problems, we've been creating jobs for the boys where the boys aren't up to the jobs, and it's government that needs to take responsibility and be held accountable. Now it's uh, the time of the proceedings where each candidate will have one minute to sum up their thoughts and present their credentials to the constituency of Middle. First of all, Jane Paul Wilson. Thank you. Um, I uh, 
feel very, very passionately and strongly about our community and our island. Um, I feel like having had some experience in the Legislative Council for the last four years, I really do want to become more involved to try and drive improvement and hence standing for the House of Keys. I believe that my experience, not just in the Legislative Council, but my voluntary community service and my uh, legal background are skills and experience that I can bring to try and add value, to try and contribute to a positive future. We do face a number of challenges, but I am optimistic that the island can navigate a positive future course and I would ask for your trust to represent you and to make my contribution to that positive future. Stu Peters. My campaign's all been about accountability and common sense because I don't think there's much common sense in government at the moment, it hasn't been for a while, and there's been virtually zero accountability, so we need to address that as a matter of urgency. I've been looking at and reporting on politics in the Isle of Man for the best part of 20 years. I want to get inside the tent and try and make some changes, and I appreciate that the uh, picture inside the tent might be very different, but I can only do my best to get in there and see if I can make changes. Alison Lynch. Ladies and gentlemen, at the age of 53, having worked in the private sector all of my life, I feel that having had um, and still have um, 10 years plus experience on a local authority, um, it is time for me to move into national politics. Um, the words that have been spoken here tonight are very important and essential, but actions speak louder than words. In the decade that I've served as a local commissioner, experience has taught me one vital thing, and that is that the, the key is to engage with the people that you represent. Listen to your people, understand their concerns. So fundamentally, when it comes to people of middle, I strongly believe that I do speak our public's language. I would be humbled and privileged for your vote on the 23rd of September. Thank you. Kieran Hannafin. Uh, I am not or will never be a career politician. I didn't join a party because I didn't want to work for a party. I don't want to work for a party or a government. I want to work for the people who vote me in. If you vote me in, I will lead by example. I'm giving away 24.1% of my salary, which is the difference between living a minimum wage. As that adjusts is each year, I will adjust with it. If I can't fix it by the time I leave the House of Keys, I'll do the same thing with my pension. I will be transparent. I will make sure your voice is heard, which a lot of people don't seem to think they do, that they will. People keep saying that they don't want more of the same. So when you go and vote, make sure you don't vote for more of the same. I am different. I ride the bus. I have had hospital issues. I have had too many of my friends committing suicide or dying of drugs. And because of that, I will sink my teeth into Timwald and I won't let go until it is sorted. David Fowler. I'm passionate about the Isle of Man. I'm passionate about politics. I'm passionate about the environment and growing the economy, sorting out the inefficiencies within government and caring for the, the vulnerable and making sure our, our um, essential services run, run properly, you, you know. And if you give me your vote, I will give you 110%. I will be really dedicated to it. I'll, I'll hit the ground running, really. Give me your vote. Thank you. OK, well, everybody's run under time, so we've got a couple of minutes, in which case I'm going to go to each candidate now uh, just for a very uh, a short summing up of how would you tell a 16-year-old or a 16 to 21-year-old who didn't vote last time for the reasons of age, how would you get a young voter to cast their vote? What would you say to them, David Fowler? Um, I would say go out and vote. You have opinions on things. If you don't vote, you don't have a say. There's, there's lots of things, you, you, you know. I mean, the young people are very keen on environmental issues, and, and, and so am I. And uh, I think that's the way get talking to them about what they like and get them encouraged to come out. Kieran you know. Hannafin. I'm 31 years old. I was 16 the first year. It was able to be able to vote, and I didn't repeatedly, multiple years in a row. During those years, quite a few problems were really problematic, and it was straight from the government, straight affecting me. Had I actually cast my vote, I might have been in a better situation. Alison now. Lynch. Young people can make a difference to the future of the island. Um, you know, absolutely... Um, and 
they're important. That you know, they have spoken to me on the doorstep, and they they want to be involved. Stu Peters. I've talked to a, quite a lot of young people on the doorstep, more than I expected to, and some of them are absolutely passionate about politics and, and deeply involved and interested in it. The majority at age 16 really aren't, don't care about it. I didn't care about politics at 16. So you can lead a horse to water, whether or not you can make him drink is a different thing. Jane Paul Wilson. I think it's interesting that many of the things we've talked about tonight absolutely speak to 16 to 21 year olds and their future. And that's what I say, this is your chance to say what you think because it will affect your future. Uh, tonight we've been at uh, Douglas Rugby Club. Tomorrow night we're gonna be at uh, Onken, at uh, Ocean Views in Onken. On Monday, that's for the constituency of Onken. On Monday at the Whistle Stop Cafe in Port Aaron for the constituency of Russian. And next Tuesday at Seven Kingdoms for Douglas Central. Tonight, thank you to uh, David Fowler, Kieran Hannafin, Alison Lynch, Stu Peters and Jane Paul Wilson. I'm Andy Wint and tonight, Manx Radio has been live at Douglas Rugby Club. Yeah.